Okay, so um, thanks um, everybody this, uh, who's joining us this evening for our first um, live stream of uh, They Call Me Coach. Um, I'm going to just start by quickly telling you about the show, what we aim to do, what we hope to get out of it over these coming weeks. Uh, you know, you don't reach all the goals that you've set for yourself. Sometimes you can, it can be a bit lonely and melancholy. So I like to reach out to coaches and just talk to them and share some experiences. So off the back of that film, I decided that I was going to do that as a regular thing. I was going to get go around the country and just talk to coaches either that I really respect or coaches that I think are doing really interesting things or coaches that I've just never spoken to, but I've always wanted to have the opportunity to do that. We're here and we've got our first guest of the show. So I'd like to welcome Coach Carl Brown. Coach, how are you? Thank you. I'm good, thank you. Very Excellent. good. How are, you, how are you coping with the uh, with the lockdown? Well, well, before before I get started, the, the first thing I want to do, I want to send my condolences out to uh, Anne Pittman and the uh, London Thunder family. You know, that's a, a big loss, not just to them, but to myself. I know her very well. And then just to the whole basketball family. You know, she gave a lot to uh, basketball, uh, not just as somebody running a club, but as a player. And she knew a lot of people within the game. So uh, I just wanted to send my condolences and from our Warriors organization and the whole basketball community. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, that's going to be felt for a long time and um, it's you know it's always tough to lose someone important it's tough to lose them in the current climate I think it brings it home to everyone that this is a, a really serious um, set of circumstances some people around the country maybe it hasn't sunk in for them or maybe they're they're still in denial but um, this is a, a real a real issue and you know we're taking this seriously hence why we're doing this yeah. from our homes today so I thank you so much for joining us. Um, um, in terms of the show, what, what we're trying to what we're trying to do is, this is not investigative journalism. You know, I'm not I'm not a journalist. Uh, we're not going to be trying to get in behind the scenes and <laughs> the nitty gritty and find out your deep dark kind of stories. What we want is we want a conversation. Uh, we want an exchange of ideas. Um, this is an opportunity to learn from other coaches, share some experiences, and hopefully provide people with a bit of entertainment. Doing. You up for that, Carl? I'm up for you. You're in charge. <clears throat> we're we're doing, in very fortunate this. circumstances that um, yeah. uh, literally half an hour before the show, um, our producer, uh, Rupert Charles, he dropped me a message and he said, look, I've put this together. I'm not sure if you'd be interested. Um, and honestly, this is a great shot start to our show. Um, it's going to actually raise my expectations every week from our producer. So, um, Rupert, if you could um, if you could run the VT, that would be great. We could be here a while. <laughs> well, you, do you see 11 seconds? That's the time left in the game. There are seven seconds left on the shot clock. There would be a foul. Bucknell at the free throw line. Right. Dan set a 76% free throw shooter. If he misses, Georgia Tech has seven seconds to come down court and get a shot. Even if he makes, they get seven seconds. That's right. And he hits it. Dean Smith is telling his team to, to foul. foul. That's right. He's telling his team to foul. He doesn't want any three-pointers. Bucknall, his second is good. That might ice it. Tech will try to get it in the hands of either Brian Oliver or Dennis Scott. They're going to foul Carl Brown instead with five seconds to go. Of course, he's going to make the first one to even set this up. And he does. Bobby Crimmins has told his team if Carolina gets the rebound to foul them. And oh, Brown hits them both. And the rebound pass stolen by Scott. He scores! Dennis Scott has scored for Georgia Tech. And there's mayhem at Alexander Memorial Coliseum. Yeah, it's a special group of guys. I'm sorry Dennis and Brian were working today on TV. But they're trying to make careers in the, in the television business. I'm proud of those guys. But it was a special group of guys. Uh, they all came together. We were very talented. And we had some great freshmen. This guy came all the way from England. We got him out of the junior college. He turned the, the uh, LSU game around when he guarded Chris Jackson. And um, it was just a great, great run. 
Uh, we had an advantage against UNLV, but they played a great second half. Uh, but I just can't say enough about these guys. It seems like it was 15 years ago, um, but it's great to be back. It was a first-year jacket who set the stage for Hammonds to end his four-year stay in style. Carl Brown, the junior college transfer, went to the line with Tech down by three, five seconds left. He would hit both free throws, putting Tech down by one. Hits them both. So, um, <laughs> coach, the, re the reason I smile is because um, I was out in Spain with you a couple of years ago and um, I remember you guys, I remember you and um, <laughs> Coach Bucknell actually talking about this very game. Like we were having a couple of cervezas after the kids were in bed and you, um, you were talking about this game. So can you maybe just for the people who aren't aware of kind of your history, can you just talk a little bit about the context of that wow. particular game? You, you kind of throw me on that one. That, that's uh, whoever put that together knows some history. Um, obviously North Carolina, they're the number one team in the ACC. We were down, um, obviously they fouled me, thinking thinking that if I made the first one, naturally you want to miss the second one so that you get the opportunity to get the rebound and tie it. But I was, I, I wanted to, you know, you, you practice your whole life, and, you know, you're down by one, down by two. I made those two free throws and that kind of threw North Carolina. So with, with Dennis Scott, all time NBA player, he gets he he gets the steal because North Carolina wasn't ready. They just put it in. They thought they were going to win, and Dennis Scott hits the three out of the buzzer. Nobody could believe it. But that that was our journey. That that is the underdogs, and it was um, a great journey. And I all me and Steve will will always talk about that. But they did get us back in the championship game <laughs> in in the Omni in Atlanta. So. Um, but, 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 that, but that's what it's about. That's about history. And I think more players, you know, and coaches need to, to, you know, to look at the history of basketball. And I think that's one of the things missing in our country is knowing our history and the people that are within basketball. But, you know, whoever did uh, put that together, that, that's a great uh, VT. Well, look, I've got to say a big thanks to um, our producer. Um, I joked with him today that he's going to have to do that every week now for, for our guests as they come into the show. But yeah, it just made me smile because I remember that very conversation. Um, I think, I think um, Coach Bucknell described it as he, they spanked you the next time. Um, he was very, <laughs> he was very vociferous about the return, the return fixture. Yeah, yeah, and and I, and I think what it was, we gave us that input, we gave them that impetus to do that because they they knew that they had something to prove, and they did have a, a like I think a two or three first round draft picks J.R. Reed, Scott Williams, Jeff Lebo, Rick Fox, King Rice. They, 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 they had a, a list of players who were, uh, you know, who, some of them are, you know, been all NBA players. So it, it just shows that the journey that we've been on as English players and uh, me and Steve, we, you know, we've worked out together, we've battled together, we, we fuss and fight together, but, but we have a mutual respect and I respect everything that he does within basketball. He's a genuine guy who wants basketball to go in the right direction. Excellent, excellent. So for people who maybe don't know some of the history, that maybe they're not aware of kind of what's come before, could you give us like the Cliff Notes version of your basketball journey? Well, just a, a short snippet. You know, gr uh, growing up in Highfields in Leicester, parents coming from the Caribbean, um, thinking that the, the pavements are paved with gold, three brothers sleeping in a bed, no inside toilets, and you, you know you, your parents are struggling to feed you. So the one thing was what coaches look for is, is guys with hunger. And when you've always been doubted all your life that you, you was told because of the color of your skin and the area that you grew up in and growing up in the early 80s, there was no go zones you know when your your your, your parents are, are telling your moms you know when they came you know and and there's no no blacks no dogs no irish so 
right from the beginning you knew you was up against the eight ball but but what it did when every door closes it just makes you stronger and you, it, it, the, the the funniest thing when i say the funniest thing because i have to smile about it it still happens today in life i have to go through it still you just got to keep being positive at what point did you um did you make the transition from being a player to being a coach because when i started my coaching career i remember you coaching and playing at the same time at one point i think in the bbl yeah um yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit about that journey oh if, if, when i look back i wasn't a coach what it was coach mims uh great wonder you know one being a point guard I, I i'm not a type of player to write notes down we with coach billy mims we had 18 plays and within those 18 plays each play had two three different options and me being a point guard i could remember all the plays without writing them down because because th that was just me being a point guard and i didn't know the, the way my brain works everything's in my head what he wanted me to do was was to run the team so it it it, it was it was just a different era and when you played with good players and you have to try and implement what the coach wants on the floor when he wanted me to be the assistant coach so from a player coach that's so difficult because the players don't respect you when you're coaching but respect you when you're playing on the floor we as players we always it's always the coach's fault when you lose but when you win it's all about you as the player so it was uh back then i wouldn't call myself a coach i would just call myself somebody who was when i look at it now who was faking the funk back then when i was coaching in the bbl if i was honest i don't i didn't have no clue look anyone who knows me um particularly anyone who's done a, a coaching course with me or has been involved in any of my uh, kind of coaching sessions they know that i'm a real proponent of kind of values-based coaching for me it starts with the values that we establish within our teams and then everything else we build on top of that can you tell me about you know the values that kind of drive you the drive the, the values that specifically make you coach carl brown well the, the I, I think uh, uh perception is, is something that i like because people will people have opinions of me and and i like that whether it's good bad or indifferent and, and for me what i like is is i'm grounded by my parents i'm grounded by uh, if people know the history my school teacher Carl Olsen was the one who molded me you know it was just to make sure that I did everything right I didn't look at what anybody else had but the key was hard work hard work and determination and if when somebody told you that you couldn't achieve you had to break through that wall and it, I just tried to keep it simple and and, and that's the the gist of it Excellent, excellent. Look, I can um, I can definitely empathise with with that kind of work ethic, particularly having Caribbean parents myself. Um, I remember once um, my mum will kill me for telling this story, but I remember once <laughs> at school, I um, I, I did really well. I got ninety six percent in a maths in a maths test. I came home, I was so excited. I got the best mark in the whole year. I told came in, I told my mum I got ninety six percent. She said, um, "What happened to the other four percent?" And, yes. uh, that that story has stuck with me and has kind of, I guess, drive me to drive my players and drive the people I work with to always try and give the absolute best of themselves. Um,